Coming up on this week in computer hardware, Google dropped $1.1 billion on HTC. We got new Nest hardware, 12 terabyte hard drives, AMD Epic benchmarked, and Ryzen 2500 APU performance leaks. All that and more coming up next on Twitch. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twitch. Bandwidth for Twitch is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Twitch This Week in Computer Hardware, episode 433, recorded on September 21st, 2017. Google did what? Welcome to Twitch This Week in Computer Hardware, Twitch weekly show that aims to bring you the most useful, most engaging, most informative, and today, quite possibly the most asynchronous video and audio available in the Twit universe. I'm Patrick Norton, joined by Mr. Ryan Shrouts. How are you, sir? Uh, I'm doing okay. Uh, no complaints, I guess. You are also asynchronous. So, oh, my God. It is an asynchronous I, I have, day for I have us been here. my whole life. My whole life. <laughs> really? Walk yeah. into the beat of a drummer no one else can hear, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> Mr. Ryan Shrout. And in benchmarking, I think you you truly are that drummer. You are the lead drummer, the drummer in advance. In any case, uh, I did mean that as a compliment. Uh, odd week, a, a weird mixture of huge news and minor news and peculiar news. And one of those things that I think is all three uh, would be Google's uh, – well, HTC's press briefing or press announcement calls it a – cooperation agreement, a $1.1 billion cooperation agreement with Google and HTC. Uh, New York Times summed it up basically saying that Google's spending $1.1 billion to, quote, hire a team of engineers from the smartphone business of the struggling Taiwanese manufacturer HTC and a bird to bring more hardware expertise to its own mobile technology operations. HTC said that many of its estimated 2,000 employees affected by the deal were already working with the search giant on smartphones. Oh, and because, you know, Life isn't complicated enough. HTC is apparently going to continue to make its own phones in competition with the phones it will be making in its cooperation agreement with Google, not to be confused with the Pixel-branded phones that they were already making for Google. Okay. Everybody up mm -hmm, to speed mm -hmm. on that one? And by the way, October 4th, we should have the next generation of Pixel phones. So Probably made by HTC. Yeah. It's a... Uh, it was funny because somebody's like, oh, finally, Google's going to have hardware expertise. So they're going to make decent hardware. And on one hand, Google already had this hardware expertise. And I think on the other hand, Google has hired a lot of tremendous talent. They just maybe haven't executed mm -hmm. particularly well on some of their products or they've killed off the products before the products really got up to speed. But um, in any case, I am very curious to see the next generation uh, Google Pixel phone. Uh, my partner in crime on tech thing, uh, Shannon, uh, Shannon's really antsy about whether or not they're going to eliminate the headphone jack. She is very pro headphone jack, anti eliminating the headphone jack. Um, because, you know, she doesn't want to buy a, a, like, I guess she either A doesn't want to buy wireless headphones or B is like me. And it's just like, you know, the delete exploder 3.5 millimeter jack works fine. I don't want to carry around a dongle. Um, and given that I've got like what amounts to a $450 giant external amp, uh, DAC from iFi, the black label, which is mm -hmm. a magnificent way to turn uh, bits from your phone into audio that goes into your headphones. Um, I still, a lot of the time, just don't want to have to carry around an extra cable, but I'm old fashioned yeah. that way. I, yeah, I, you know, it's, I, I just thought it was, it was an interesting move. And also, I mean, it, it makes you realize just exactly how much money, uh, Google has at this point where they like drop a billion dollars to, you know, <laughs> you know, I mean, that was like some of the speculation on like reading in Twitter and some of the articles I read were like, why didn't they just buy HTC? Why didn't they just hire the thousand engineers away from HTC? Why didn't they do this? Why didn't they do that? And part of me thinks that, that Google wants outside engineering teams to build a lot of its hardware at this point because of the complicated messiness on Google's internal, internal hardware development teams. Um, or you can tell me that I'm a Google hater and I can go stuff myself under a rock, in which case tweet at Patrick Norton because, uh, you know, you're more than welcome to. Free speech, yo. I mean, it. You know, I don't think you're wrong. I, I still think it's odd. It's still, it's still they're paying this much money. The HTC still exists. They're getting employees plus some uh, like patents, right? 
as well right. as part I guess of intellectual this. property. But that's the it's part my is, IP is like, portfolio. Well, yeah, I mean, what's in the IP portfolio that's in that's so that's worth all that much? I I I have no idea. I, I I can't. I don't know. They don't give any examples in any of this. I guess yeah. um, non-exclusive you know, license for HTC intellectual property. Right, and non-exclusive, meaning that either HTC can use it or HTC can license it to other people. Still, um, there's there's a lot of confusion that goes wrong with this, and it's um, you know HTC is still going to make other phones, but they say uh, enabling a more quote streamlined product portfolio, which to me just reads less phones, right? Like fewer phone options we have to deal with. Um, I, you know, to me, this does not sound like Google buying a hardware partner, right? They're not buying a hardware manufacturing capability. They're not, they're not enabling something like that. They're basically buying talent. And it's possible that, I mean, there was a rumor earlier in the week that HTC, you know, had a, like, was, they were considering bankruptcy and all these other options. And Google might just said, how about we just give you a billion dollars and you stay there and we continue to pay the employees that matter to us that are generating these products that are very important to our, to our uh, phone brands. Uh, How's that sound? And HTC goes, okay, yeah, you just pay us a billion dollars. We'll be around for a couple more years while you need us until we need more money. <laughs> That's kind of what it feels like to me, but I don't know. Right. I mean, it does you say know, at the uh, end of the story that it still has to, uh, at the end of the New York Times story, the deal, uh, no, where's that? The transaction is scheduled to close pending regulatory approval in early 2018. Now, if it has to have regulatory approval, I don't know if that makes it a more substantial deal than than I feel like it is because it was requiring mm-hmm. that. I don't I honestly don't know enough about it to know, but it it just feels like this weird pay you off so we can still launch this uh this next uh, Pixel phone without the main storyline right. being our manufacturer filing for bankruptcy. Bankruptcy. Yeah, and that makes sense to me, especially given some of the availability issues on the on the last round of Pixel phones where people just couldn't buy the phones they wanted. Something crazy to look at Recode uh I uh, had a pretty good breakdown looking at the market share uh, of end user sales. And HTC went from being about 10% of the market when it peaked in 2011 and is now apparently below 1% of the market. They were heavily involved in Windows Phone, which basically disintegrated. Huawei's kind of gone from 0% of the market to the 10% of the market that, that HTC used to own. Um, you know, Apple's gone from like 20% of the market down to 15% of the market. Uh, and Samsung has gone from 30% of the market when it peaked in 2013 down to around 20% of the market. There's so much competition and there's been so much mm-hmm. change. There's so, you know, the, the changes have been dramatic and intense, especially with the Chinese manufacturers coming in. Uh, it's seriously heavy. You know, no mention. It's like they didn't, they didn't, you know, maybe the intellectual property is stuff that's coming out of the Vive team. Um, you know, it's, uh, you know, maybe they just want to, you know, I, th- I think he probably nailed it. They probably want to make sure their premier partner to manufacture the phones is still around in a couple of years. Um, yeah. you know, it's, uh, you know, and one of my favorite comments on this, uh, uh, I got a link in the show notes for this one. I just added, uh, Devinda Hardawar, uh, just treat them better than Motorola, Google, um, <laughs> which is really, um, you know, which I think is a, a really, really solid thing to say because Motorola kind of got bought, ingested, and I'm going to just be brutal and say vomited back out um, in a way that wasn't particularly great for, for, I think, Motorola or their consumers. Not that Motorola still isn't making great phones, but it's just it's mm-hmm. odd to watch how companies kind of get ingested and then stripped down, uh, which, you know, I could have been saying back in the 80s talking about steel manufacturers and the Rust Belt, uh, but... Uh, you know, I would be very curious to see how maybe maybe Google's get some of the the IP from the Vive area. Um, yeah, crazy kind of announcement, big announcement this week. Uh, and at the same time, like nine to five, Google's reporting that uh, Project Fi is finally getting a mid range, like a four hundred dollar phone, which of course is the Moto X four. Um, so, you know. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, you know, this is, uh, you know, this is you know something we've been expecting since the middle of this summer, uh, you know, but the irony being like the week they announced that they've dropped one point one billion dollars on a, 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 you know, a hardware manufacturer, a handset manufacturer is also the week that uh, 
they announced that their new mid-range phone for Google Fi is going to be from Motorola, which, if memory serves, didn't they used to own Motorola? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. You know, and while we're talking about hardware, uh, Nest uh, has a new alarm system, video doorbell, and outdoor camera. Uh, so, you know, there you go. Whether or not they've still hold the same place in the alphabet universe as they did before the ascent of Google Home is an entirely different question. Um, right. It's funny because yesterday I was literally on Amazon looking to buy another Nest camera and Ken from a customer said, yeah, I think they announced a bunch of new stuff today. And I was like, wait, what? Really? And so I went back and started looking through the things and now I've delayed my purchasing decision on a bunch of other stuff. I think it's interesting. I think the doorbell is interesting. I think the security system, right. um, you know, is interesting. None of these products, you know, the, the outdoor camera um, with the, the face recognition, none of it's new. It feels like Nest is kind of playing catch up. Uh, and maybe it almost feels like these are products that they've been baking for a long time. And then the Google acquisition happened and they all got delayed. Uh, nothing, <clears throat> nothing seems like a standout in here necessarily right. um, to me. Uh, is it, I mean, it's not shipping until November. It's in pre-order now. Part of me thinks like, you know, is this just them, you know, having pulled back, reorganized, come up with a new plan, right? Because there were the Nest thermometers, which, you know, as yep. I've probably bored everyone to death with at this point, uh, I found tremendous issues with, I mean, fantastic job controlling the temperature, love the remote monitoring, you know, love mm -hmm. this ability to, you know, sort of learn how my house heated and cooled. Um, but, you know, a lot of the, the smart features, you know, uh, didn't work. For example, it decided nobody was home. I had to turn off a bunch of features because it would like turn off the heat in my house, despite the fact that my entire family was in the same room as the Nest. Yeah. Uh, and then, of course, they launched the, the Nest uh, smoke detector, the smoke and CO alarm, CO2 alarm which uh, had some issues. Uh, and, and I think they may have just sort of pulled back, regrouped, and, you know, kind of gone, okay, how do we do this? How do we take, you know, we've, we've got the camera company we bought, which kind of imploded. You know, I think there was, my understanding, there was kind of some interior struggles at Google over how Nest was going to kind of fit within the larger Google universe. I think all that infighting got smacked down. And hopefully they have a nice, solid suite of products that works well, uh, because they're certainly not inexpensive. Um, you know, you're talking right. about, you know, there's still $200 cameras, you know, maxing out at $350 for their IQ outdoor camera. The alarm system is $500, you know, and they're, they're working within a lot of, you know, they're working against a lot of pretty heavily entrenched companies that seem to have a pretty good job or do a pretty good job. Um, right. you know, I, I'm curious. I'm very, very yeah, curious. I, I would like to try them out. I just don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. There you have it. I've had. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I got nothing else. I got nothing else. Uh, I got something else because we haven't had enough uh, random stuff from Google. So Google Home Mini, Droid Life uh, posted a picture. They look like sort of pet rocks. I'm going to call them smart rocks because I have a sense of humor. $49 Google Home devices. And it's one of the fun things about watching all the mesh gear come out is how they've, you know, each manufacturer has done its own particular take on making something more attractive to put in the home. And now we've got something that looks like it could be a, a, a you know, hipster iPad cover. Uh, and I mean that actually in a nice way, not an obnoxious way, even though it probably sounds like that. But expected to show up on October 4, uh, the Google Home Mini, like a $49 micro version of the Google Home. So right. available in chalk, charcoal, and coral, powered <laughs> rather than wireless. So $49, Google Assistant, and all that good stuff. And because I'm completely out of control on Google News this week, apparently the Chromebook Pixel is not dead. It's a pixel book. It's a two in one. It's going to be $1,200. And this, uh, this room, this story, this rumor showed up in enough places simultaneously that I'm thinking it's probably a pretty heavy duty leak. Um, the pixel book will reportedly come with 128 gigabyte, 256 gigabyte and 512 gigabytes of storage. The latter two priced at 1400 and $1,750 respectively, which is a lot of cash mm -hmm. for a Chromebook. Um, or mm -hmm. excuse me, a, a Pixel two and one, um, you know, Pixel pen sold separately for a hundred bucks. Um, 
you know, and this is again, this is another situation where like Google launched something. They did the Pixel laptop. It was expensive. It had you know a certain cadre of enthusiasts, uh, and then they kind of stopped producing them, and they didn't. Maybe they weren't available anymore. And I think that's for me. You know, as we talk about what's going on with the HTC, uh, you know, <laughs> cooperation agreements. Um, you know, and Google Fi's sort of erratic compatibility with, I mean, Google Fi has a very narrow set of phones it works with. Sure. Um, you know, Nest kind of like pulling back and then coming back to the forefront again. Uh, and this Pixelbook 2 and 1, you know, I, I think I look at this and I'm like, it's Google, it's Android, and everything Google does in house kind of seems to be. We're really, really behind this, except now we aren't. And that always <laughs> frustrates me as a consumer. It should. Um, I mean, it should. You know, I mean, that's, I mean, it's funny because, like, you know, having worked with a lot of mesh networking devices at this point, you know, whether you're talking about Eero or Amplify or Orbi or any of the other ones, one of the things I'm kind of in love with about these products is, you know, you spend $500 on a router, and oddly enough, you're getting regular steady updates and the stuff delete expletive works. And, right. you know, if, if you're spending, I just, I just want to see, I, I, I want Google to feel like it's got like a plan and it's going to, I don't know, you know, I, I'm, I'm probably, boring everybody to tears at this point so let's completely shift directions and talk about a gaming yeah. laptop <laughs> or maybe i'm not boring or maybe you had something you wanted to say but it's just like i look at google no. and i see this mixture of like really well executed products the phones and kind of everything else being you know a mixture of stuff that functions kind of well or functions really well or may disappear mm. um you know i don't know no, I'm with you. No, I I agree. You know, the, the, the I think probably the the Chromebook is the most developed of all of those kind of side projects, right? right? Like after Android and you know whatever their web their web platforms and stuff like that. But I'm with you on the Pixels and the Nest and uh, uh, the Pixel Book, for, for example. But yeah, yeah. So some some more dedication to it in the long run would be good. So tell me about Max Q running the MSI GS. 63 VR laptop. I'm going to brazenly assume this is a VR ready laptop. And how long can I run my HTC Vive glasses on it <laughs> when I'm in the airplane? Uh, uh, probably about 30 minutes or something like that would be my guess. <laughs> yeah. So that the, the MSI GS 63 VR, uh, this is not the first iteration of it. It's been around for a one or two uh, previous generations. Uh, and previously it shipped with the GTX 1060 GPU, which was kind of the minimum for meeting uh, VR capability, um, hence the name uh, on the laptop itself. So this is our second Max-Q design laptop. The first one we looked at was the Asus ROG Zephyrus, which had a GTX 1080 Max-Q. This one has a GTX 1070 Max-Q. But what's interesting about it is, so if you want a... Uh, indication of what Max Q actually does. This laptop has existed. It had previously on, only been able to use a GTX 1060. Now we're able to use a GTX 1070 Max Q. So you get a little bit more performance out of it in the same form factor uh, that you would before. This one's, you know, it's more of a traditional notebook. You'll see like the keyboard is where it would normally be. The trackpad's where it would normally be. The Zephyrus had all those weird kind of placements for things. The trackpad was off to the side. The keyboard was way up front of the machine. Standard connectivity outputs. Um, this one does not have a G-Sync display. It does not have an NVMe PCI SSD. It has a SATA-based storage. It's still, you know, 512 gig SSD, so not a, not a you know, dramatic drop or anything like that, but noteworthy there. Um, graphics performance-wise, it is... Um, so what we found with the 1080 Max-Q in the previous laptop was that it was around the performance of a GTX 1070 full. When I say GTX 1070 full, I mean a, uh, a GTX 1070 would be integrated into one of those larger, thicker, heavier, noisier gaming laptops that you would traditionally think of as a gaming laptop. So the 1070 Max-Q is below that to some degree, right? And if you look at that, mm -hmm. that graph... Uh, there of the observed frame rates, you'll see you know, the black line is the 1070 Max Q, and it's you know it's uh, it's 20 probably 20 frames, 15 20 frames per second lower than the 1080 Max Q. Uh, if you look at GTA 5, you see it's probably closer to like five to 10 frames per second slower, and in Tomb Raider, it's probably back to you know your 20 frames per second slower. Uh, it's all very consistent. It's all pretty smooth uh, performance across the board. There, it is a all running a 1080p non-G-Sync display, you know, all V-Sync off, all those normal settings. So it's it's pretty good performance. 
a moderate step above a GTX 1060. That again, that's kind of the point here between the between uh, for the Max Q design philosophy or productization, whatever you want to call it. Uh, CPU performance, it's essentially the exact same CPU as in the ROG Zephyrus, the Intel Core i7 7700HQ, which is a true quad core, true hyper threading, all that stuff uh, is working really well. Battery life, still bad, um, but better. You got uh, 2.97 hours on our Wi Fi browsing test with the MSI machine compared to 1.95 hours on the ROG Zephyr. So you do get a full hour of additional battery life out of this baby, but it's not, it's not a connectivity style machine, right? Like that's not its right. intent. So keep that in mind as you go through it. I mean, otherwise it's, it's, it's a decent machine. It's a good form factor. I've had a couple of these in, in the office before. Um, it's expensive. Uh, $2,400 for the MSI GS 63 VR as we had it configured uh, 1070 max Q, you know, 512 gig SSD, all that type of stuff. Um, the RG Zephyrus sells for like almost the exact same price, maybe a hundred dollars less. And that comes with a G sync display. It has an NVMe SSD. It's a little bit smaller, but it's faster. Um, but you do have the form factor and usability concerns, right? Remember that the Zephyrus was like a nightmare to actually use on your lap, for example, those types <laughs> of things. So there are, so there are some trade-offs, uh, as you look through it. And also, if you if you're not tied to a small form factor, you can still get normal gaming laptops that are you know inch thick or heavier, bulkier, and you can get a GTX 1070 based one for like seventeen hundred dollars. In which case, you're going to have better gaming performance than what you get on this 1070 Max Q as well. So I still I still see the benefit to the design that Nvidia is going with 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 the Max Q. Um, I think maybe some of that. Some of that might be lost because this is an existing design from MSI that has been around for a couple of generations. So there's nothing new about it. It's simply a slightly improved GPU performance out of the box for it. So uh, worth taking a look at. But, you know, I, I still don't think we've hit the prime of what Max-Q will mean for gaming laptops in the near term future. There you have it, ladies and gentlemen. There you have it. Oh, my goodness. Um AMD Ryzen 5 2500U APU with Vega graphics spotted in Geekbench uh, benchmarks. I am torn on this one because on one hand, I am a huge, huge... I have I have paid out of pocket for a fair amount of uh, AMD Ryzen hardware because it, it takes names and kicks ass and gives me more cores for less money. Uh, and then we got really excited about the Vega cards uh, this summer. And then several minutes after they started shipping, the Vega cards sold out. And uh, now the latest rumors, completely unsubstantiated, are that we will not have much more in the way of Vega cars until November. Meanwhile, um, the APUs previously known as Raven Ridge, as Tim Berry writes up on PCPro.com, um, are starting to show up. The AMD Ryzen 5 2500U are starting to show up in Geekbench benchmarks. And uh, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm excited. Um, because APUs are certainly going to be a big deal. APUs with rising level performance are going to be a big deal for a lot of people who aren't gamers. Um, you know, one of the things that, that Tim points out is it doesn't reveal clock speed. Um, we don't know what the maximum boost is. It does list two gigahertz, but that's probably sort of the, the, the base, uh, not the, uh, advanced one. Uh, we don't know anything about, you know, in terms of details and what's going on with the GPU and that, um, Right, but you know, it's it's an early sign, and it is it is not a bad sign. Which is no, no, it's 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 pretty good, right? So, Raven Ridge is going to be an interesting beast because, like, we know what the CPU core's performance is going to be, and they've talked about it being a quad core part. So we know where it's where its perf is going to is going to fall in that regard. Um, pending pending clock speeds announcements, the GPU is going to be interesting, right? So this is. It's going to have Vega architecture in it. We don't know how many compute units or what clock speeds it's going to run at. We don't know what memory technology it's going to use. Chances are we're still going to use like DDR4 memory, you know, off of the off of the CPU controller itself as part of this um, instead of any kind of dedicated memory on the on the chip, mm -hmm. which will, you know, slow things down pretty dramatically. Um Previously, AMD's claims of 50% more CPU, 40% more GPU compared to 7th generation APUs, the, so the previous gen, um, which 
so it does a couple things. One, it should bring CPU performance up somewhere near Intel's 15 watt and 25 or 35 watt processors, right? Near their quad core. This is, you know, the, the, this is one of the reasons Cabby Lake R was even launched a couple of weeks ago. Mm -hmm. uh, and then also the, the seventh generation APU already had a faster GPU on it than a, or than an Intel's current parts. So increasing that by 40% more is going to, move that needle further in AMD's favor. So now the question will become, um, are they building these parts for like mainstream gaming notebooks? So you get all in one, you know, an APU that has CPU and GPU capability. Uh, are they going to be pushing this as like OpenCL compute, right? So that uh, they, they start to talk about all the programs like Adobe Photoshop or Premiere or Office or whatever that take advantage of OpenCL capabilities. Um, because that's kind of what they had to lean on with the APUs previously in mobile form factors was like we don't they didn't have the CPU to even come close to compare to Intel so they depended on the GPU to make up for some of that. Now they're kind of they have a good CPU so do they do they lean into that quite as much or do they give more credit to the CPU division than they have in the past? So it'll be interesting to see. Um, so this is all still pending a Q4 release time frame as well, I think. Right. So, yeah. Should be interesting. Well, we're talking about uh, Geekbench results. Uh, a I mean, the, the summary for this is uh, uh, Geekbench basically says the A11 Bionic is stupid fast. That's my executive summary of this article on Insider. Um, but uh, apparently something, you know, it's it's a, a mat, like a huge jump over the A10 Fusion and the iPhone 7. Um higher than base Intel Cobby Lake Core i5 processor or the one that's used in the 13-inch MacBook Pro. And, you know, these are synthetic uh, benchmarks, essentially. Um, you know, the the scores are pretty consistent. Um, comparing a, and I'm quoting, uh, I'm quoting uh, Daniel Dilger up at Apple Insider right here. Um, comparing the similarly spec iPhone 7 to iPhone 8 the A11 Bionic is 25% faster in single core and 80% faster in multi core scores this is particularly noteworthy because Apple's latest chip delivers new neural net camera ISP and GPU capabilities that are above and beyond what the generic processor benchmark measures um, and that was that was one of the interesting things coming out of the Apple announcements uh, uh, Om Malik wrote a really interesting article where he discussed that you know Apple's prowess right now Apple's strength right now is not so much uh, in the phone designs, but that they can create all of these custom chips. Um, you know, the wireless chips that are in the Apple Watch. We'll get into that in, a little later in the show. Some of the issues with the implementation uh, of the cellular on the Apple Watch. Um, you know, the 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 sort of you know additional devices uh, or additional features or the custom silicon they can build to sort of tackle very specific problems that are not as easily handled by a general purpose uh, processor. Um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's interesting, you know, and, and it's, uh, it's curious to watch because, you know, I haven't, I'm not really complaining about, you know, I would like more memory, you know, my iPhone six, uh, mm -hmm. because I would like it to handle multitasking or multitasking, <laughs> multitasking more gracefully, you know, but there's not a lot of things I'm doing on my phone that makes me go, mm. you know, what I really need here is a metric delete expletive ton of additional CPU power. I'm not rendering a lot of video. I'm not doing a lot of, you know, high end, high resolution gaming. Um, it's also interesting, uh, early reviews, uh, uh on the iPhone eight, uh, it's I've uh, yeah, they're they vary between the you know this is the iPhone seven and this is the iPhone seven and you really don't need to upgrade if you have an iPhone seven or this is the iPhone seven s and you really don't need to upgrade if you have an iPhone seven to wow the portrait lighting is like the kid that fell asleep when he was learning how to do X Y or Z in Photoshop class the portrait lighting is really disappointing um, the uh, you know the performance is good. Uh, you know, if you have something older than an iPhone 7, it might be a really attractive upgrade, especially the 7 Plus. Um, not a lot of not a lot of people out there suggesting that you need to upgrade uh, from the iPhone 7 to the iPhone 8. And again, it's essentially we've said this before, the iPhone 7s. Um, but uh, you know, and also the key charging. Apparently, you absolutely positively have to have it centered on the mat. And a lot of people are suggesting that it's a little slower than they expected, mm. uh, and not in a you know, casual, chill, kind of awesome way. 
What is uh, incredibly awesome, if you have the money uh, and your NAS will support it, is that Western Digital's uh, launched their 12 terabyte gold drive to consumers. 1.5 terabytes of data per platter uh, with a capacity of 12 terabytes. Um, man, that's just yeah, a whole lot of storage. <laughs> yeah, it's a whole lot platters. of dollars, too. With 1.5 terabytes per platter, spinning at yeah. 7,200 7, RPM, 256 megabytes of cash. And, uh, hey, man, it's $521. Um, that is only 0. 0.0435 cents per gigabyte. That's actually lower than your preferred target price that doesn't exist yet for SSDs <laughs> of 10 cents a gigabyte. So, you know, it's not that expensive per yeah. gigabyte. We'll sure. see. Let's, um, let's go to Amazon.com. Let's yeah, okay. look up three right. terabyte hard drive. Uh, what terabyte and, again? Oh wow, there's a three terabyte. Okay, three terabyte. Right. Uh, you know that's okay. Three, ter three it's gonna terabyte, three terabyte reds are 111 lower. bucks. So you can have one 12 terabyte drive or four three terabyte drives. <laughs> um, maybe five uh, if you go for a blue instead of a red. Well, let's see what sure. it looks like when we look at four terabyte. Yeah, I think you're looking at four is probably a, a, a good sweet spot there. Or cost per platter, cost per bit. Yeah, um, 110 bucks for a blue, 135 for a, for, bucks for, for a red. Yeah. Well, let's yeah. go to six terabytes. And <clears throat> uh, oh, things are getting expensive now. The blues jump up to 200 bucks. The reds jump up to 217 bucks. And you're still yeah. paying more than twice as much. <laughs> well, yep. more than twice as much. Uh, uh, to yeah. get uh, 12 terabytes. Man, I never thought I'd say 6 terabyte NAS drives look inexpensive, but suddenly they kind of look inexpensive. So, you know, yeah, that's a gift. You gotta do whatever you gotta do. You know, on the upside, wow, now I'm wondering, will my NAS support... Actually, that'd be really funny. I could have... I don't even know. It depends on what it is, if those drives even existed at the time. I would. I don't see... There's no technical reason why they wouldn't be able to do that. Um, but... <laughs> I guess I guess we could say that about a lot of things. So we probably could say that about a lot of things, but in a nice way. Man, now I really want to figure out if I can fit twelve terabyte drives in my Drobo <laughs> or my Synology. And I think the answer to no to both is no. In any case. Mm. Uh, one last Apple thought before we move on. Uh, when macOS High Sierra is released to the public next week, the new Apple file system, APFS, will be limited to Macs with all Flash built-in storage, which means it won't work with iMacs and Mac minis that include Fusion drives. And if you're looking at that and, you know, you were looking mm. forward to running, uh, uh, if you were looking forward to running, uh, Excuse me. <clears throat> if you're looking forward to running APFS uh, on your Fusion-based Mac, um, I'm so sorry. Mac Rumors uh, has lots and lots of information on that for you. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's crazy, right? Because they they had uh, Fusion Drive support. They were beta testing it uh, when they first released the High Sierra beta. Um, but it, it's gone, been removed, and... Uh, Quote, public beta testers who had a Mac with a Fusion drive converted to APFS will need to follow a long list of instructions to convert back to HFS+, Plus, including making a time machine backup, creating a bootable installer, and using disk utility to reformat their Macs and install Mac OS High Sierra. So, you know. On the upside, if you can do you have imagine a Can you imagine Windows drive, doing something like that? Yes, but I've been working with really? Windows for a long time. I, I, on one hand, I get what you're saying. Um, uh, you know, uh, for the most, do, do I believe them? Do I, can I? Yes. Do I think they would do it in their current iteration? <laughs> Not so much, but every so often there's a, a kind of an overnight update to OS 10 and I'm like, what just happened? Um, you know, uh, so certainly I can conceive of it. Uh, you know, I just, Maybe I, I don't think they would do that. Yeah. So. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, by the way, my uh, Drobo 5D will only support 10 gigabyte drives. And I believe I should mention that Drobo has been a sponsor uh, at Twit at various times. So I don't get spanked. Check back for firmware updates. You never know. One day. Yeah. Because, you <sighs> know, 
I, I, I got to spare $2,500 to expand mm-hmm. my NAS. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that, that's divorce territory. Um, <laughs> Epic. What's going on with, with, with Ambie's Epic? He's kind of busting loose and taking names and kicking ass. I mean, is that a oversimplification Basically, even by my standards or what? Uh, no, I mean, it's, it seems to make sense. So we, we, you know, we don't do a lot of, we don't do direct server testing here most of the time, Epic, Xeon, that type of stuff. We depend on some other people who have a lot more experience in that regard. Uh, a guy named Patrick Kennedy at a website called Serve the Home de- uh, does this stuff all the time. He published his um, latest Epic test results um, in this, there's a quote here from his words. It says, while AMD is very competitive at the high end, its mainstream offerings are competing with defeatured Xeon silver CPUs and absolutely obliterating what Intel is offering. Um, and when we're talking about mainstream server parts, we're talking about $750, like Epic 7351P, which is a $750 CPU testing against Intel's Xeon Silver 4108. Uh, they look at server applications like Gromax, OpenSSL, a chess benchmark. You know, everybody's got to have one of those. Um, so single socket versus two socket Xeons. And in most of the time, you know, they're talking about a significant performance advantage for the Epic processor, even though it has one socket instead of two. Not to mention it has 128 lanes of PCIe compared to 96 for the Xeon. It can support two terabytes of memory instead of 1.5 on the Xeon. Um so he he basically comes away significantly more impressed with these mainstream offerings on the Epic platforms than um, than the Intel Xeon scalable stuff, which is which is interesting. Um, and it kind of this this was AMD's messaging with these with these parts was hey we're we're not going to go into every market with 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 our first generation of Epic processors. We understand that what we're going to do is we're going to go into the markets that we think we're strong at and we're going to be super super aggressive in pricing. Uh, price for performance, um, you know, feature capability, and all that is playing out in these early reviews that we're seeing of actual systems being released. So, um, if you're a guy listening to this that does, uh, you know, server management, IT management for some small, medium businesses or e- businesses or even larger companies, it's worth taking a look at at this guy's uh, at Patrick's review. Patrick Kennedy's review at Serve the Home uh, on this because he also did one earlier that looked more at their super high end parts as well uh, and where you know epic is competitive but it's not as dominating a fashion as apparently it is here in the mainstream uh, segment there you have it amd could be a perfect fit for tesla and uh you're excited about this amd working with tesla to make the awesome still rumored um it's 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 interesting this kind of came out yesterday um that somebody at CNBC posted a story that there is that they had heard that AMD had not only been working with Tesla to help build a semi-custom chip for them for their uh, autonomous driving systems, but that Tesla had a chip back in house and was doing testing on it already, right? Hmm. And so I, you know, seeing this and seeing that it kind of made sense from a technical standpoint, and that you know. Uh, all the pieces kind of fit together, right? Tesla hired uh, in January of last year, Jim Keller, who was the lead engineer behind AMD's Zen CPU architecture. And they've been hiring up quite a bit of uh, a CPU engineering talent up to you know a team of about 50, according to this report. Uh, and you don't do that just to validate somebody else's systems. You don't need somebody like Jim Keller to come in and say, yeah, no, I approve of that NVIDIA part or I approve of that Intel part, right? You do that if you're going to kind of design your own deal. Um, so it made sense that way. Uh, the, you know, Jim Keller's history with AMD makes sense there as well. Um, it also means that the, you know, you need a lot of GPU compute capability or, or potential, like just raw parallel compute capability, which NVIDIA has been providing for Tesla already. Um, mm-hmm. But GPU performance is kind of a well-known thing, right? So if, if you're building a semi-custom chip, you might have uh, something like that's in the Xbox One, which is going to exceed the performance levels of what, uh, let me say that again, the Xbox One X that's coming out this winter the performance in that SOC probably extends past what a GTX 1060 has today or is, or is pretty close to something like that. And that's essentially 
where Tesla's uh, autopilot system is based now. It's based on a GP106 NVIDIA-based GTX 1060 part. Um, but if they can get better performance, better efficiency, better control over their pipelines, maybe some pricing advantages as well by working with AMD to design a semi-custom, make it themselves, go completely vertical. It's the same argument that you know we've talked about with Apple. Why, why are they building their own GPU now? It's because they want to have full control over what these systems are. Machine learning, artificial intelligence, all that stuff is really hard to do, um, especially if you're working with external hardware, external software, external sensors. So now they want to bring it all in-house so at least that's that's the assertion made by these different stories and it does just kind of make sense as well so we'll just have to see how how this plays out and if if and when tesla or amd will ever confirm or whatever these these particular these rumors and stories the rumors the stories the mayhem the future of tesla everywhere oh my goodness so uh ios 11 Big, 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 big update to the control center. Uh, mixed reactions to that. Uh, it is going to take a little bit of getting used to if you're if you're kind of hardwired and barely even looking at the current control center. So be you know for, forewarned is forearmed. Um, but apparently, uh, and I thought this was kind of shocking, um, Bluetooth and Wi-Fi are not fully disabled when toggled off in control center on iOS 11. Mac Rumors has a good write-up on this by Joe Rosnell. Um, you know, uh, support documents say Bluetooth and Wi-Fi will continue to be available for AirDrop, AirPlay, Apple Pencil, Apple Watch, location services, and continuity features uh, like handoff and instant hotspots, even when you think you've turned them off in Control Center. Um, so, you know, on one hand, people aren't probably pretty worried about this. On the other hand, you know, if you're trying to turn off an accidental uh, airplay connection because a speaker is blowing up in your children's bedroom at two in the morning, uh, you're going to be really irritated if you go funk, tink, and it doesn't stop. Um, it also means I have some questions about what that does for battery life because a lot of the reasons why you would turn off Bluetooth and Wi-Fi is to maximize battery life. Um, there's also probably some security potential issues in there. Um, so, you know, you know, if you disable yeah. Wi-Fi, auto join is going to be disabled, um, but not necessarily Wi-Fi itself. Um, you know, so basically to completely disable Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, you're going to have to dig into the settings application instead of using the incredibly convenient uh, and somewhat obvious control center. I'm not a fan of this decision uh, at all, but uh, that's just me. <sighs> Yeah, what you'll notice is if if um, I've got iOS on this iPhone now, when you when you if you long press on it, it brings up a, a slightly bit more contextual menu, and then if you just tap Wi-Fi, it just says Wi-Fi not connected. It doesn't indicate that it's powered off. If you go in through the long settings and you actually flip off Wi-Fi, there's actually a a, a slash through the middle of the icon. So there's some indicator there. It just needs to be accessible from this same menu. Not accessing it from the same menu that we've had access to it forever seems uh, stupid. So I, yeah, <laughs> like fix that. Like it's clearly it's a dumb idea. But I think uh, I think that would mean you officially agree with me on that decision. Uh, yeah. You know, I'm suddenly not so antsy about not having pre-ordered uh, uh, a series three apple watch um some issues with apple watch lte uh, lauren good wrote this up at the verge um she was reviewing the apple watch series three with lte and there was quote notable connectivity issues and you know it would try to connect to unknown wi-fi networks instead of connecting to cellular uh, when she was out and about without her phone. Uh, she gets pretty detailed in the review on that. It's a great review uh, if you're kind of looking to see somebody's hands-on experience uh, uh, with the Apple uh, Watch Series 3. Um, and Apple replaced her review, first review unit with a second one. That one had some of the same issues and the company finally responded, quote, we have discovered that when Apple Watch Series 3 joins unauthenticated Wi-Fi networks without connectivity, it may at times prevent the watch from using cellular. We are investigating a fix for future software release, uh, when that might happen, and uh, how it will fix the problem is not known. 
And, uh, you know, I, I like what uh, Ms. Good says. Um, this marks the first time that Apple has acknowledged a known problem with the smartwatch just after pre-orders and right before it officially ships. So, uh, you know, it's be interesting to see how long that takes and how frustrating people do or do not find that. Uh, and in more cheerful Apple news, the uh, – First, ARKit apps are showing up in the iOS app store today, including uh, games. And, uh, I, you know, I love the idea of, you know, splitter critters. Um, so basically, you're, you're, you know, it's, it's your guiding creatures back to a spaceship. Uh, and then, a, you know, a, you scan a surface and then it puts a fully playable version of the game into the real world. Uh, Warhammer 40,000, um, you know, farming simulations, um, Goodness help me, uh, Thomas the Train sets. Um, you know they're doing some stuff where it will allow you to place 3D models of furniture in a room, um, a whole bunch of other stuff. So uh, I'm kind of excited to see. My probably my favorite one is Night Sky Five, um, is coming out. Uh, you know where it basically uh, 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 brings the solar system into your home so the idea is that you can sort of walk around it inside of your existing room um so i don't know i'm a big fan of of astronomy applications and if you are curious about what's coming up with ar kits uh, including the probably legendary ikea place which is a furniture placement app so you can hold you know your phone up and finally get an idea of what you know blark starf or Ickthorpe or cat vomit. <laughs> um, and I shouldn't mock IKEA given how much furniture I've used uh, of theirs oh, over yeah. the last few decades. But there you see it. All the IKEA furniture in your room without having to go to the glorious fight that is a visit to IKEA, although the meatballs are nice. So I mean, yeah, they are. I get Swedish fish while I'm there too. <laughs> There's a ban on Swedish fish in our house because oh, no. of the sugar and the frenzy and the spinning and the weeping. If you are into bargain gaming, if you have no money, you're going to be delighted that the crew over at TechSpot got busy on your behalf. Esports benchmark GeForce GT 1030 versus Radeon RX 550. Uh, in theory, you should be able to buy either one of these for under 100 bucks. Uh, one of them, obviously, is much bigger than the other. Um, you know, the, the GTX... Uh, 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 the, excuse me, the uh, GTX 1050, uh, you know, normally sells for, for 110. The GTX 1030 is like 70 bucks. Um, G the RX 550 should be 80 bucks, although it's it's uh, enormously difficult to find them uh, anywhere near that price because it's enormously difficult to find a lot of inexpensive GPUs because Ethereum mining. Um, but uh, it's pretty cool. They're going for like you know, Twitch games, high frame rates. They're running a Ryzen 3 uh, test bench system, the 1300X. Uh, really, really good read if you're into not spending a lot of money. And uh, the other thing that was just kind of uh, irritating to me uh, was that uh, Samsung's finally letting you turn Bixby off. You can disable the Bixby button because apparently nobody likes Bixby. Um, but uh, yeah, that's the, the button on the S8 and the S8 Plus, the Galaxy S8, Galaxy S8 Plus. Because um, it was like there, but you couldn't do anything with it until, you know, basically last month when Bixby Voice was rolled out. Uh, you could use it for Bixby Home, basically, which is kind of useless. Um, you know, third-party apps were launched to allow you to remap the button so you could use it to launch apps you actually wanted to use. Samsung went berserk uh, and uh, clamped down on those. And uh, so now you can turn off or disable the Bixby button. Um, basically, can I turn Bixby Home on or off when the button is pressed? Uh, you just can't. Uh, you just can't actually uh, reassign it. <laughs> yeah, as, as somebody who has a Note Eight in his hand right now that I'm testing, um, I have only hit that button accidentally thus far. Um, so being able to disable it is nice, but yeah, being able to assign it to something else would be much more beneficial. It would be. Just a thought yeah. there, Samsung, if you're listening. With that, ladies and gentlemen, we should uh, we should thank you all 
I would like to thank you all. Ryan and I would like to thank each and every one of you for listening to This Week in Computer Hardware. We're known as Twitch. You can find this at twit.tv slash twitch. If you'd like more Ryan Trout, and I bet you do, you should go to pcper.com. That's the hardware website he runs. It is an amazing resource. In fact, I was consulting it just this week while talking about video editing PC builds and how Ryzen has pretty much taken over Five hundred thousand dollar and fifteen hundred PC builds. Uh, PCPro.com slash leaderboard is the place to find that. You can find me talking about hardware and answering viewer questions and reviewing products, including somewhere around here. There it is, the Logitech Craft, uh, which I did not leave close enough to pick up. Um, which is I, a two hundred dollar gaming keyboard of questionable utility. As much as I love the Logitech Harmony remotes, and uh, if you are one of the people who was freaked out to discover that you downloaded a piece of hacked software directly from a legit source known as uh, CCleaner, which is it's a crazy story. We get into it uh, on this week's tech thing. T e k t h i n g. Um, it, it and apparently was part of a larger industrial espionage espionage action that was targeting like 18 companies, including uh, uh, Intel and Microsoft mm. and elsewhere. Um, kind of an interesting story on that. But uh, TechThing.com, and then uh, I talk about uh, amongst other things that iFi uh, Nano Black Label and uh, mm. one more $150 in-ear noise canceling headset, um, which I compared to the Bose QC20. Um, and if you're if uh, if you've been looking for noise cancellation and you want music that sounds good even when you're not surrounded by 95 to 105 decibel noise on an airplane, it's worth checking out. You can find that at avxl.com. With Very that, cool. ladies and gentlemen, again, thank you so much for watching us here on Twitch. Twitch.tv slash Twitch. That's a place to go. And uh, with that, I'm Patrick Norton. I'm Ryan Stroud. We'll see you next week on Twitch. Twitch.